Good evening, students of British and American culture. This is part two of the 16th century, week five. I want to start out by saying today there's going to be very few updates. We're going to get right back into um, the topics where we left off with uh, the death of Henry VIII. Um, things are changing. Even as I make announcements, things are changing and evolving day by day. So I think uh, taking a break from doing that for a while is fine. Uh, plus, we need to get through the rest of the material for this week. So today I'm going to try, I'm going to try and stick to the basics uh, in the interest of saving time. Um, we are going to make a slight adjustment. I'm going to give you an assignment today. And instead of it being due on Monday, I'm going to have you hand it in by next Thursday, which is April 16th. Um, that is because I already have two classes going on Monday, and uh, I think moving your deadline to Thursday will allow me some relief. I know professors are supposed to be better at managing their time than students, but the reality is uh, having a flood of emails every Sunday night or Monday night is uh, not working out very well for me. So, I'm going to give you an assignment today, and I'm going to tell you about that now. Uh, I would like you to submit uh, one page, uh, as you did about the uh, invasions of the British Isles of, of Britain. Um, you, the first assignment you did was about uh, those people that invaded um, Britain, Albion. Uh, which were the, of course, the Romans, uh, the Angles and Saxons, the Germans, uh, the Danes, uh, <clears throat> and then the Normans, finally. This time I would like you just to choose a revolutionary event. Uh, we haven't got to American culture yet because uh, the 16th century is when it really, uh, the idea of starting a colony in overseas starts to germinate in the uh, English mind and in, in the Scottish and the British in general. The idea of doing things that the Spanish and the French have already started doing um, starts to take hold uh, in British culture, which at this point we're still mostly talking about English culture, but the Scottish start to be interested in doing it too. Um, so we're not talking about American culture yet, so I want you to choose, we'll just stick to British stuff. So. I want you to choose any event. Uh, it can be one that we've discussed so far. Um, please don't choose something from the first millennium. Uh, so anything from 1066 onward. Um, not including the Norman invasion because that was a revolution. But uh, I would like you to choose something that you think is a very important, almost like a turning point. It doesn't have to be a true revolution because by definition uh, a real revolution is something that is uh, dramatic, uh, extreme, violent, and sudden. Um, that is really what the tight definition of a revolution is. And um, a lot of these things that we're talking about don't qualify. So let's, let's say the assignment is not based on uh, the definition of a revolution, but just something, a critical event that occurs any uh, any time except in the first millennium of British culture. So from the Norman conquest onward, something that happens uh, in British culture, in English or Scottish uh, culture, that um, affects the society, the culture um, enough that you can see that there's a change happening. So there's a before and after sort of picture. So we've talked about a few of these things most of the things I, I mention are fit this criteria. So you can talk about the Pre Peasant Revolt of 1381. You can talk about the Black Death. You can talk about uh, the Great Famine uh, in 1315. You can talk about Magna Carta in 1215. You can talk about, uh, I almost said Samuel Beckett. Thomas Beckett. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, Saint Thomas Beckett later, but Thomas Beckett. Uh, getting killed, you know, in the church, in the cathedral, um, you can talk about that. You can talk about the Reformation, which we're going to continue to talk about a little bit today. Uh, you can talk about, you know, Henry VIII 
uh, or you can talk about Queen Elizabeth, the before Queen Elizabeth and after. Before Shakespeare, after. You can choose something that we haven't talked about yet, if you want. You can talk about World War I, which at the time was called the Great War, because there was no World War II. But you can talk about um, 1914 versus 1918. Uh, that's one of the biggest changes, I think, in, in the history of uh, British culture, which we will talk about later in the course. But... Um, you can talk about before Napoleon and afterwards. I know Napoleon's not British, but the effect, the Napoleonic Wars were at, at certain points just really the British against the French. And so you can talk about before Nelson and after Nelson or, or before Napoleon, before revolutionary France and afterwards. You can talk about before the United States um, becomes a country and has the war against um, the United Kingdom and the empire, the British empire, and afterwards. I want you to write about what changed a lot and what didn't change very much. And that's kind of, um, not kind of, but basically what I'm trying to communicate to you today. When I'm talking about the 16th century, this is what I'm wanting you to understand. Um, the, the definition of this period is very flexible. There's lots of different names. I'm using 16th century. It's not the best term. It's just the one that I learned. Uh, I took a course which was a fantastic, um, it was an English literature course because I'm an English major, but um, I learned a lot about the 16th century in general through that you know, perspective of literature. I, we started out you know, at the beginning of the 16th century with things like Thomas More that were really more religiously oriented and some of, I mean, Thomas More wrote in Latin. I believe the first version of Utopia was in Latin, as I mentioned. And there's English versions later. And by the end of the, the century, uh, everybody's just forgot about Latin completely. And not everyone. Many people are just writing in English directly. And Shakespeare and his brothers and sisters, I also took a class called Shakespeare Sisters because there are women. Uh, there are less women, but there are very... Um, able and um, intelligent and, and uh, interesting writers. Queen Elizabeth herself is a writer and uh, the fact that the leader of the country is a woman for 40 years uh, probably contributes a lot to um, the, the respect and the ability of women to actually um, write anything. Uh, it's usually, again, religious, but these are sort of, this is almost like a medieval hangover. Um, Shakespeare starts to expand the envelope and he starts to write about things that are not religiously centered and uh, it's not restricted as much by the, the great chain of being, the way, and, and the, the hierarchy and the uh, stratification of society. So you start to break down these barriers that uh, the medieval order and the medieval culture and the medieval society and the the um, concentration of everything in human culture around this you know religious community starts to change and that's why the 16th century is so important that's why this is the first time in this class after five weeks that I'm not talking about a thousand years I'm talking about just a hundred now, um, as I go forward and talk about this stuff to you today, I'm going to refer to my book quite a bit just to organize things. Uh, I realize that I jumped around already, but that's probably because I'm organizing things by topic and by chronology, whereas the, the book might not follow exactly how I deliver it to you. But we are talking about chapter three, whether I jump forward and backward and mention things in the exact order of the book, is not important just focus on the things that I do mention uh, because those are the things that you will be tested on and those are the things the reason I'm testing you it's not because I'm trying to well I'm trying to see how well you study of course but those are the important things that's why I'm testing you on those things I don't want you to forget them uh, that's why you are tested on those things so um, keep in mind everything, as I said, everything I say in the lecture, number one is the most important thing. The video lecture is the number one source for studying. 
Number two is the textbook, okay? Number three is the website, and number four are the slides, which are really just supplementary material, okay? To help you fill in the gaps, which I may leave out occasionally. Um, but really, I will never take any questions or ask you something hidden in the slides or the PPT that, that I haven't shown you in class. That will not happen, so don't worry about that. Just focus on the lecture and the, and the book. Okay, so the 16th century is important. Um, I have two sources for this particular lecture. Not, not just two, but two main sources. The primary source I mentioned already yeah, if I can find my book here, this, this beast, this beast uh, I'm going to advertise from because um, it's a monster. And you can see these are all my notes. This is uh, The English and Their History by Robert Toombs. I doubt very many of you would want to read this. Um, it, it is gigantic. It's a thousand pages. It's almost as thick as a Bible. I read the whole thing multiple times. This is my primary source for my textbook, so I, I hope I get to, um, you know, shake hands with this, this guy someday um, because I love his book and I used it a lot. I guess I can't shake hands with him these days. I'm going to have to do, like, you know, the coronavirus elbow bump. <clears throat> but uh, he, he for the, throughout the course, I rely on him a lot. Uh, for today's lecture in particular, the, the 16th century, um, I'm a big fan of something called audible.com. I use the Canadian version, so it's audible.ca. Um, but it's basically um, an audiobook service. And when I drive my car or when I, I can't sit down and read, I'm doing gardening or cooking or something, uh, I'm trying to you know brush up on my knowledge. I listen to supplement um, the literature. I have physical literature and my computer. So I, I listen to a lot of stuff, and um, there is this program on Audible called uh, The Great Courses, and uh, it's, a, it's a subscription service. I'm not advertising for them either, but if you find, as you get older, that you want to study something, but uh, you don't really want to go to a class, uh, but you want to, to listen to an expert, this is what it's for, These, this um, company produces these great courses um, and they have basically, you know, I, I believe this guy I'm talking about is from University of Chicago. He graduated from Oxford. Um, they're just um, really, really famous, well-educated, um, excellent researchers and excellent teachers, excellent speakers. And they, you pay a subscription fee and you get once a month, you get a credit and you can download um, a file and listen to it. So Robert Buckles from the University of Chicago, he uh, does one of these great courses, uh, lectures, and I, I listened to the whole series multiple times. He talks about, he's talking about, he's an expert about early modern uh, England. So he talks about from the period of 1485, which we mentioned last class, Henry Tudor, Henry the Seventh. From him uh, right up until he goes through the Tudors and he goes through the Stuarts uh, in this lecture in particular um, right until 1715 about 1714-15 uh, when Queen Anne dies. Um, he taught me a lot. I, I learned a lot of information and, and I, I, he's a history professor but um, history is culture and culture is history so there's a lot of crossing over between what he talks about and what I do. So I, I owe him a great debt of gratitude for providing such a great resource. And so a lot of the things I mentioned today will be derived from the, my book, my gigantic book, and uh, the expertise of Robert, Professor uh, Robert Buckles. So thank you to those two individuals. Um, I will link both of those um, that both the book and um, some a link to uh, Robert Buckle's work at the bottom of this lecture. If you care to follow up on it, that's up to you. So my job here is to sort of condense and summarize what they say because Robert Buckle's actually talks about a span of about 150 years, and I'm trying to talk about 
2,000 years and multiple cultures. So we can't get into the level of detail that he does, um, but I will mention some of the things that he does. Now, Henry VIII dies. <clears throat> so there's three children he's left behind. And one of the things that he did well, despite the fact that um, he had so much trouble with his marriages and everything else, was that he did leave somebody to take over. Um, and the order was fairly well determined. The boy was going to go after Henry. So Edward, although he was the youngest, he became the king. And everyone went along with it, essentially because Henry VIII, as I said to you, his, he had a gigantic personality. And if you didn't go along with what he said, you probably didn't last very long. Um, in most cases, you got your head chopped off. So he had really consolidated everything, as I told you. Henry VIII basically turned England into this authoritarian state. He, he became a, a tyrannical king towards the end, where basically he, um, whatever he said was done, and if it wasn't done, then that person was removed, one way or another. They either ran away to another country, they got banished, or they got killed. So when he died, uh, the force of his will, not only the will that he wrote, but just that his presence and his, uh, the commands that he made, essentially um, were followed. Were the, the, the dictates that he had left were, were so, I, I suppose the society and, and the upper class and the government was so used to the machinery of trying to follow what he commanded that basically even after his death everything he wanted to be done played out the way he wanted to so Edward became the king um, unfortunately he was young uh, so he couldn't rule with any authority and uh, there were various powerful people one uh, uncle in in particular his his dead mother's uh, his dead mother's family controlled him uh, and really he wasn't really in in control for most of the time that he tried to um, lead the country so um, he wasn't a very healthy young boy um, so it's not surprising that he got sick fairly early he only ruled for uh, five or six years and uh, but the main thing that I want you to remember is Edward succeeded to Henry and Henry was, as you know, the person who reformed the church. But this is, and this is key because I couldn't fit this in the last time, is that although the Anglican Church is Protestant, it's really half Catholic and half Protestant. In his heart, Henry VIII was still a Catholic. Okay, you got to understand, he's basically a Catholic that doesn't want to follow the Pope. If that makes sense to you okay he, li he likes the rituals he likes everything about the church he just doesn't want to listen to the Pope who's not an English person and he doesn't like listening to anyone so even God I suppose I'm not really I mean he does listen to what he, he respects the ceremonies and the structure of the church but he wants to be on top of it he doesn't want to be uh, a part of it like a, a, a wheel or a cog in the machinery he wants to be the one who controls the machine he loves the machine, but he wants to be the one who pulls the lever. So that's what he does. He gets rid of the Pope, and he wants to keep the Catholic Church the same, except for Henry VIII is the leader instead of the Pope. He dies, and that's the way he's trying to make it be. Uh, his son, though, Edward, grows up with these people that are actually real Protestants, unlike Edward's father, uh, Jane Seymour, his mother, her family are, are leaning more towards the Protestant uh, end of the spectrum. And there's a good reason for this, because when Henry takes all the land from the Catholic Church, which is literally 15% of the entire country, um, it's not bad land either, it's valuable. Uh, he's suppo he should have kept it and made money from it, but instead, Henry VIII being the, I don't know, not frugal, um, uh, <laughs> irresponsible, hot-headed man, leader, king that he is, he, 
he needs money for wars and for his expenses, so he sells it off. And, um, you know, wealthy tradesmen and upper class English people buy the church land. And so now you have 15% of that land in the, the hands of the upper class. So those are those people going to be Catholic and want to give the land back to the church? Or are they going to be Protestant and be like, that's my land. I bought it from the king. Um, now I'm Protestant. Well, it's, it doesn't have much to do with religion at that point. It has to do with the fact that that's my land. And if I become Catholic, I have to give my land to the Catholic Church. So Jane Seymour, her family, Edward's family, that's a fundamental reason here. I know there's there are... I'm not saying there's not a strong religious undercurrent here, but there's democratic ideas, you know, like representation by people and, and um, nationalistic ideas, and there's financial, economic, personal reasons. All of these things make many English people think that they want to be Protestant and not Catholic. So it's not really that the Catholic Church was so horrible and terrible. There were cheaters, there were bad Catholic priests, um, there were rich bishops that were stealing money and they had multiple positions at the same time like you know they were bishop of this and then they were you know they had other positions that they just got money for then they didn't actually do their work. Uh, that's called pluralism, right? Um, they had uh, and or absenteeism where they like have they have jobs but they actually don't do the job they just collect the salary or or the, the you know the tithing the money from it all these things are true but the catholic church fundamentally was i think not unpopular i can't say it was super popular because there were problems with it but in 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 a in a very real sense in england especially in henry the eighth's eyes and the upper class a lot of people were very catholic in their um their, their upbringing, their cultural, they were culturally Catholic, okay? Um, they may have disliked some things with the Catholic Church, but the shift really comes with all these other ideas, you know, coming in. And, and when, you know, the Catholic Church always thought that it was dangerous for people to learn how to read. Uh, those of you who are Korean, you'll understand because Sejong had the same problem. When Hangul was created, Sejong kind of had trouble getting the scholars and getting uh, the research and, and, and uh, using the language uh, of K Korean language because the whole purpose of it was so that it would make it easier for people to read. But there were certain people in Korea that did not want the population to be literate, right? And so you get Hangul created hundreds and hundreds of years ago, 600 years ago, uh, when Sejong was around. Am I getting that right? I guess he was he was around in um, in the 15th century, so it's about 600, give or take. Um, he he created this uh, amazing language, which you all know. It's called Hangul, and it's very simple. I learned how to read it in one day. That's how good it is. But nobody used it for hundreds of years because I have. I I also have a book like this. This, this book here is written like 400 years ago, 300 years ago. 300 years ago. This is a, a diary, uh, a Yangban diary that I helped translate. Chungnam National University did this project, and I, I can't translate this, but basically the Yangban, the, the guy who wrote this, um, the Sunbi, the scholar who wrote this, he wrote it in, in Hanja, not in Hangul, so it has to be translated from... Chi Korean Chinese characters, then to Korean, and then to English, and then at the end of the line, I proofread it. That's, that's a book that we, a collection of letters by a wealthy nobleman uh, to help you understand Korean culture. I have that on my shelf. Right, so that's, this is the same kind of thing about the Catholic Church. That's the reason I, they want everything done in Latin, because they know that if everybody reads the Bible themselves, they're going to find things. Jesus was not a rich guy. Jesus was uh, a friend of the poor, uh, of the weak, of the, the people that needed protection. He didn't ever um, say good things about people.
people like Henry VIII. I mean, Henry VIII probably did, I, I'm not, I can't say, but I, I think he probably did believe in Jesus and pray to Jesus and, and love him in his heart. But it's, it was hard for wealthy people to find things in the New Testament that really supported their behavior. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus say, kill everyone that doesn't agree with you. Steal all the money and the land from the church. Henry VIII can't justify that. So there's a huge conflict here. This is, this is what we call ideology, right? So this is what Henry VIII leaves behind as his legacy. Uh, Edward grows up, King Edward VI. Don't worry about the number because there's a lot of Edwards. So anyway, Edward follows Henry. Henry VIII, remember that. But Edward VI, just, we'll just call him King Edward because that's the only one. I'm going to talk about in detail in this course. Edward grows up fairly Protestant. He gets an education. He believes in things in a Protestant way. So, for example, he tries to start these public schools. Um, it's not public schools the way you think of them. Public means anybody can go there if they have money. It's not the government pays for it or the king is like free tuition for anybody in this town. It's a public school means you don't have to be a rich person and then, you know, show your bloodline to get into the school. Um, or you don't have to take a really restrictive tests. You just, you can go to these, they're, they're basically grammar schools, what um, they evolved into grammar schools. So Edward starts these things where, they, but it's a start. You can't just make a public school system out of nothing, especially when uh, Edward's father, Henry VIII, blew all the money that he had sold all the land that he owned that was his endowment. He got rid of everything that Edward needed to do anything. Um, so now he has no money. How could you make a public school system when his father spent all his money on wars that he lost? So Edward has a, a tough life. It's very short. Um, he's very Protestant. He doesn't really persecute per se, but he, he pushes the country in a Protestant direction. He dies six years later, okay? His older sister, the one that was born from the Spanish queen, of uh, Catherine of Aragon, is Mary. I wish I could talk about Mary more, but basically we're just going to say Mary is one of the most unpopular uh, monarchs, kings or queens in the history of England. Her nickname is, her epithet is Bloody Mary. And bloody just means, in English, if you call, if you say somebody in England, you say bloody, it's like, you know, it's like saying the F word, kind of, or it used to be. It's a very strong word. Bloody just means terrible, awful, garbage, or whatever. And in this case, bloody literally means bloody, because she basically wanted to turn back the clock. She was half Spanish. She's smart, just like all the Tudors, Henry VII, Henry VIII. Uh, Edward, then her, and Queen Elizabeth later, all of them can speak like four or five languages. All of them are musical and athletic, essentially. They're, I mean, Edward's not healthy, so he can't do the things that his father did, but otherwise, these people are very capable, um, intelligent, well-rounded individuals. So she's half Spanish, she's all Catholic. Half Spanish, half English, 100% Catholic. She becomes the queen. She marries King Philip of Spain. Um, king Philip of Spain wants to be the king of England. The people of England say, absolutely not. You're Catholic. We're not. Um, queen Mary, you're Catholic, but you're English, so that's okay. Um, she's initially okay with this. It's a sort of a difficult ascension, but she manages it. And then as she rules, she tries to put the pressure on England to change back to Catholicism. So... Bear with me here. Henry VIII, Catholic, changes it to Protestantism at the end, kind of, switches, um, Edward switches it to Protestant. Now it goes back to Catholic again because of Queen Mary. She starts persecuting people, finding, you know, um, making laws and punishing people for um, not following Catholic, you know, um, not worshiping like Catholic people should. And, um, you know, the Catholic clergy start coming back out and maybe they, you know, hit, they were hiding some Bibles or hiding some, 
you know, precious objects or something, uh, paintings or stained glass or covering things up. They bring all these things back out and she tries to um, turn back the clock uh, and make England Catholic again. But um, there's a lot of resistance to that. So she starts killing people, burning people, executing people, throwing people in jail. And then she gets sick and she dies. Um, nobody knows if she had lived longer, whether she would have been able to make some sort of uh, counter-reformation, like counter-revolution happen and turn the turn to, uh, England back into a Catholic country. I, I, I mean, I've heard, I've read a lot of people argue that she could have. I, I'm skeptical. I think um, what, there was a really good quote by one of, uh, I'm not going to be able to remember the exact person who said this, but um, there was an English, you know, man who wrote or was quoted saying uh, something to the effect of stopping the Reformation. Like Ken Henry VIII started this process and then he wanted it to stop. He wanted to just, just to remove the Pope and then everything else stay the same. He said when Henry VIII tried to stop the process of becoming uh, more Protestant, would be like asking somebody, you know, to, to throw something out a window and trying to stop that object halfway down. Like the momentum of, of changing one fundamental rule of the Catholic Church caused a cascade of change. So would um, Mary, 10 years after her father's death, when her father was not able to stop the process, would she have been able to turn England into a Catholic country again when it would already you know, the process that was already well on its way? I don't think so. That's my opinion. But it's just my opinion. So you'll get people saying that Mary, it could have been done. Uh, there was, there was uh, probably 5% five, 5 or so of the population that really was truly Catholic still. Uh, that's not a lot. Um, but maybe there could have been a reversal. That's a possibility. However, it never happened. We don't have to worry about that. Mary got sick. She died just like her younger brother. So that left one Tudor left, Queen Elizabeth, which she is the main event of this lecture. So I'm going to carry over my discussion of um, the different um, types of Protestant religion into my next, next week's lecture because it just won't fit. I'm already getting towards the end of uh, this talk and Queen Elizabeth is the main event here. So. Um, this is going to be the last part of what I discuss for you, but uh, I want you to remember Anglican. This is a fundamental. I think this is the best way I've ever heard Anglicanism described. And if you're Anglican and you don't agree with me, my apologies. But this is I've been to Anglican church and I'm Presbyterian. I have a cross around my neck. Um, I'm not super religious, but. Um, I do have a very deep background in Presbyterian uh, religion, which is Scottish. Uh, a lot of Koreans are Presbyterian. That's uh, in Korean, that's Changlo Gyohe. Okay? But that's not important. Um, what's important is for this lecture, I'll talk about Presbyterianism next week. For now, Anglicanism is essentially a hybrid of Catholicism and Protestantism. It's a halfway point. Um, and uh, Professor Buckles was the one who described this it this way. He said, uh, Anglicanism is thinking Protestant and behaving Catholic. Okay, so when you go into, basically what I'm saying is you go into an Anglican church, they have bishops, they have ceremonies, they have the rituals, the sense of community. Um, that's sort of what Catholic people uh, like about church is the the connection, um, the festivals, the events, um, the ceremonies, the rituals that make them feel that comfort them. Right? It's it's almost like uh, they act. Their religion has to be acted out. It has to be you have to be visualized and experience the religion. And and um, Anglican religion, especially a long time ago, um, retained that. As much as possible, and Henry VIII liked that. That's he lit candles. 
whenever a baby was born, and usually that baby didn't last very long, but he had three that survived, he lit candles in the church. And when he died, he left money for, for uh, monks and priests to pray for his soul, you know, every Sunday, that kind of stuff. That's Catholic stuff, um, very Catholic stuff which is part of Angl Anglican, the Anglican Church. And nowadays, sometimes you see, um, you know, the saints and the shrines and the, the processions and stuff happening again in England because they're sort of retrieving that cultural, you know, identity from their past. And that goes back to pre-Elizabeth, pre-Edward. It goes back to Henry VIII's time. This is 16th century stuff. Um, and then on the, on the other hand, though, mentally you know spiritually in their head the beliefs the idea that you know you should study the bible in english and that um there's equality and the pope doesn't tell you what to do all these things that are sort of ideologically based those things are protestant so anglicans look catholic and think protestant i think that's a really simple and succinct way to describe it and uh, that's why I'm telling it because we run out of time so easily when I'm talking about this stuff. So that's how you can understand Anglicanism. That's one type of Protestantism but it's kind of special because it's really barely Protestant or it's halfway Protestant. We're going to talk about other versions of Protestant religion that are much much farther, more extreme, more radical. We're going to talk about that next week because that is going to be one of the reasons that you know the civil war in England happens it's because the the there's extremes there's catholics on one extreme and there's radical protestants on the other presbyterians and puritans we'll talk about that next week so queen elizabeth some people some professors who know her better than me like to call her queen beth um beth is just short for elizabeth and uh Whenever I hear that name, I remember my Nana. My Nana, Nana is a, just an affectionate term for your grandmother. My grandmother, her, her name was Elizabeth, and uh, we always refer to as Beth. So Queen Beth, same name as my Nana. Um, she was a great monarch. She, she should be called Queen Elizabeth, I'll, I'll say this right away. She should be called Queen Elizabeth the Great. We had Alfred. Um, actually, Canute got the title great, too. The, I think the only reason why Elizabeth didn't get the term great is because they had other names for her. Um, so she didn't need to be called the great. She is the great. She, maybe because she was a woman, they just the men didn't want to admit it at the time. So she got all these other titles like the Virgin Queen, right, or Gloriana. And these things are on the same level as the great. She was fantastic, and uh, she had her her faults just like anybody but she was just a, a well-rounded um, leader and and you can tell that she managed the she managed she was such a great leader because I mean the country thrived despite all the negative things that were going on in the 16th century um, she overcame all of them I, I don't think you can say there's anything that she didn't overcome except um, maybe the finances, because when she dies, she leaves the royal tre treasury in a terrible condition. But that's not a problem she has to worry about, <laughs> just, like, just like Henry VIII, because Henry VIII spends all of the money and just like passes it on to Edward, and Edward doesn't deal with it either, and it passes to Mary, and then by the time Elizabeth gets it, She's got to be creative to come up with ways of getting money that don't make people super angry. Uh, and this, this gets passed down from king to queen to king to queen until the 17th century, and then things just explode. So we'll talk about that as well. She definitely didn't keep her financial house in order, but I don't think... I think that's Henry VIII's problem, not hers. So she just kept the ship you know, from sinking. And uh, that's not, um, that's not really her fault. So this is what happened. Um, Mary died. She was Catholic. And Elizabeth was not. Um, she never really talked about her religion 
very much because if she was vocal about it, there was a good chance that Mary, if she didn't like Elizabeth or had an excuse or was worried about Elizabeth, would just kill her. So Elizabeth was basically a prisoner for her whole uh, adolescence into young adulthood. And when she was 25, her older sister died. Bloody Mary died. And then Protestant Queen Elizabeth came out of the tower and said, hello, I'm a young lady. I've been locked in the tower for a long time. And here I am. I am your queen. Now, you got to remember, it's difficult to be a queen, more difficult to be a king. I think it's difficult to be just the king or the queen. Just to be the leader of a country is a, a lot of pressure and stress. But you can imagine this particular situation would have been very difficult. But just her personality and her personal, her confidence and her ability to manage um, people, her understanding of politics was incredible. You, I'm not, I, I'm tempted to just say Nobody gave her an IQ test, but I'm tempted to say Elizabeth was a genius. Um, Julius Caesar was a genius. Nobody, if I said that, nobody would say, oh yeah, no, no, Julius Caesar was stupid. Clearly, he's a genius because look at all the things he did. So is she. She just walked out of the tower, um, evaluated the situation. She was a prisoner and like creepy old guys used to come visit her. So she probably had a you know, a lot of anxiety while she was in the tower, but she managed to learn how to write. She studied and she came out of that situation more powerful than anybody else in the whole country. You, you know how many people would have just gotten eaten alive, you know, by everybody else's. Everybody wanted a piece of her. Everybody wanted to control her, but nobody could. Instead, she played every powerful person in the country against the, each other. And so raised herself above all of them. It's amazing she was able to do that. One of the biggest problems she had to deal with, of course, was the religious question. People were still at each other's throats. Some people were super Catholic. Some people wanted to be more Protestant. Nobody was getting along. And she, she was the one that really made the compromise work. She has a really good quote again. Uh, I wish I had written this down. I'm just going to do it from memory. Um, somebody was recorded describing her attitude about religion in England and she said she did not seek windows into people's hearts. So she didn't care. Again, this is, you can think Protestant or you can think Catholic or whatever, but just go to church in an Anglican church and be respectful to the government, to her, to the church, do whatever you want outside and think what you want, but at least follow the, you know, the manners, essentially, um, of, of what the church wants you to do and what, what her government wants you to do. And that is enough, right? She's not going to, to make you make promises on the Bible uh, about certain things. You just have to, she's, she's really offering people their own freedom as long as they participate in the community and respect um, the national interest. So um, that for most people that is acceptable. Uh, there's sort of a group of people on both sides that are not satisfied so there's kind of a simmering bubbling resentment underneath this thing but most people are kind of sick of you know uh, Henry VIII changing the rules and then going to Pro more Protestant with Edward and then back to Catholic with Mary and then killing all these people that she doesn't like and then now Elizabeth is Protestant again and everybody's like, you imagine if you were born and you grew up and you were just Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, you'd just be like, okay, can't we be, can't we be both and can't we just all go to church and not hate each other? And that's probably what a lot of people thought. So that is how she succeeded. She made these compromises and um, that's sort of the way that the English church continued to exist up until now. A lot, not a lot has changed since 400 years ago in terms of way, the way that the Anglican church is set up. So again, genius? I don't know. Maybe that she's just a master manipulator. I'm not really sure. But I think that's a, maybe that's a sign of genius if you can manipulate everybody however you want, then you're pretty smart. 
Uh, so Queen Elizabeth managed to do that. That was one of the fundamental things that she had to do. But there's other things too. This this um, thing with the Spanish, you know, her older sister, her stepmother, you know, the original queen, Queen of Aragon, uh, Queen Catherine of Aragon. Um, she, she was Catholic and she was Spanish. And um, the Spanish were very Catholic and they were trying to sort of spread the Catholic religion all over the world. Um, they were fighting people all over the place, uh, native people and, and Turks, uh, the Turkish, the, the Islam, the Islamic people, they were fighting against them in the Mediterranean and they're, you know, fighting people in North Africa and they're fighting people in Mexico. They're just all over the place trying to change people into the, you know, Catholic, um, good Catholic people that join the church. And meanwhile, you know, in their own backyard, kind of, uh, a former ally, England decides not to be Catholic. So that um, basically causes this friction. People in Spain don't like the English because they're Protestant and people in England don't like the Spanish because they're Catholic and there's a lot of resentment there, not the least of which was related to Philip being the king of England, kind of, but not getting real power. He really hated that. So. Um, they decided after Queen Elizabeth caused a whole lot of trouble, one of her solutions to her financial problems was to just allow um, the pirates, uh, they didn't really have a lot of money. She was very um, relatively poor compared to the Spanish. They had, the, you know, the, the Spanish um, kingdom earned more than 10 times as much money a year. Um, it's sort of like, financially, it's sort of like, uh, you can imagine South Korea trying to fight a war against the United States. Um, when another country has ten, a ten, a, an economy that's ten times bigger and a military that is five times bigger, whatever the ratios are, that's not a good fight to pick. Um, so they were not interested in fighting the Spanish, but they needed to do something. So basically, Queen Elizabeth encouraged uh, English seamen uh, to just on their own although she helped them but she didn't she pretended she didn't she sent all these people out sir francis drake is the most famous but um sir john hawkins and there's there's a whole bunch of them but francis drake is the most famous um he was nicknamed el draco by the spanish the dragon the dreaded el draco it's a great nickname but he used caused all kinds of problems he stole their gold and their silver sank their ships harassed them attacked them. He did all kinds of terrible stuff and uh, Philip put up with it for quite a while but then he got sick of it and he decided to invade England. Um, obviously the English were pretty terrified of this idea. The Spanish were at this point um, the, the richest country in the world. They had the most, the most global reach of any people that had ever lived. They were bringing silver and gold from America. They'd traveled around the world. Francis Drake copied them. Uh, Magellan was the first. He was a Portuguese navigator who did this for the Spanish. But uh, Sir Francis Drake copied him and went around the world and stole a bunch of money and bring it back. But he was copying them. The Spanish were the original powerful pirates, navigators. They had huge ships. They had a lot of money. They were famous warriors. They were conquistadors. They took over Mexico. They took over South America. This is like fighting a superpower. So they were not, the English were not enthusiastic about um, fighting these people and they were terrified of the invasion. So in 1588, um, the Spanish, they, they had been doing this for several years, but they gathered together all of these resources, all of these soldiers. Um, the Duke of Parma was you know, in the Netherlands and came up to meet them. And this gigantic, the, probably at the point, that point, it was the largest invasion, seaborne invasion, uh, seaborne invasion force in the history of the world um, came up the English Channel towards England. And the English had to attempt to fight them off because if they landed in England with the 25,000 Spanish soldiers that were on the ships, there was a good chance that, you know, Protestant England would cease to exist. So 
you know, Queen Elizabeth, in a show of bravery and um, um, confidence, goes down to Tilbury and jumps on a horse and makes a famous speech saying something like, I can't remember the words exactly again, uh, I may have the weak body of a woman, but I have the heart of a king. Uh, one of her most, I, I'll uh, also link that speech for you so you can get it exactly. It's one of the most famous speeches in English history, so I should get it proper. But basically she's saying, I'm, I have the weak um, body of a woman, but uh, I have the spirit and the strength, inner strength and the heart of a king. Um, so she makes that speech. It has really no relevance whatsoever because Francis Drake and all the rest of the English are fighting the ships, you know, down the channel, fire ships and attacking them. It turns out actually that the English didn't have too much to worry about because these big huge Spanish galleons were not really designed for sea combat. They were more designed for you know transportation and for boarding. So basically these fast you know powerful like with not powerful but you know in, in size but they had um, better guns, longer range, the ships could um, sail faster and maneuver better. These these English ships were just better, technologically more advanced. They basically, you know, sailed around and blasted the galleons, and the galleons had trouble. Uh, they could take a lot of damage, but they really couldn't do anything back to the English. So they just stayed away from them. It's it's sort of the way that I mean, there's a lot of parallels with Yi Shin in the way that he you know arranged his ships just to blast away at the Japanese who the Japanese wanted to grapple and get their ships close and board uh, the the um, Korean ships but once they got close to they couldn't get close to them because the turtle ships and the the I'm getting off topic here but I love Yi Shin the Panok Sun and the Kabuk Sun they um, the the Korean ships were just better technologically so Yi Shin knew how to use them the Japanese really couldn't do much and the same thing with the Spanish. Not only were, was Francis Drake a much better leader and sailor, an expert navigator who'd gone all the way around the world, and the, the Spanish leader was, the Spanish um, commander died, and he was replaced by a person who was a high-ranking military officer who'd never sailed, who had never commanded ships. That's who you have. You have better ships with better technology, with a, one of the best sailors in the entire you know, 16th century against somebody who has no idea what they're doing and uh, big, fat, slow ships. So what was going to happen? Uh, they were going to lose. Um, so they lost. And the, the way that they escaped was by taking, following, the wind was blowing up the channel. So the Spanish Armada um, took the wind up the channel and tried to go around the north side, which is a horrible idea. The North Sea is almost always stormy, so if you look at a map of England and Ireland, the north side is it's a long way to come back to Spain. So they do this huge loop over Scotland, and they come down on the far side of Ireland, and the Atlantic, some storms come out of the Atlantic and smash all of the ships, not all of them, a lot of the ships against uh, Ireland, and you know, the Irish just come in pick them off when they get out of their ships or grab all their stuff and like throw them back in the water or kill them, do whatever they want with them. There's nothing they can do. And uh, uh, some of the ships make it back to Spain. But, you know, the massive amount of money that King Philip spent on the Armada is gone. And the whole he, thousands and thousands of soldiers and sailors died. And uh, England was relatively untouched. So you get this kind of, uh, Spain is up here in terms of Money, power, influence, reputation, military strength, uh, preparation, everything is in their favor. And then after the Spanish Armada is, is sunk and destroyed in 1588, it, it, I wouldn't say it flips, it doesn't. It just, the gaps get smaller. And then Philip doesn't give up, he tries again, and it doesn't work. And then the English try to, to invade Spain, it doesn't work. But this gap, this huge gap between Spain and England starts to narrow. And it's just um, over the next hundred years, it's going to flip. Uh, other people like the French and, and the Germans and, and other um, states are going to get pow more powerful too. But the Spanish are far ahead of the English and they're going to close the gap over the next hundred years. And then Spain is after 
a century of fighting the English off and on, they're going to become weaker than the English. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's just, I don't, I don't want to say it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a historical fact of this is the, a turning point. The Spanish Armada is a, is a point where the English culture gets reinforced. It's not the end of the Spanish Empire. The Spanish are still much more powerful and they have huge advantages over the English, but it's the start, you can see it later, that this is where the Spanish start to decline and the English start to rise. And, you know, one of the things is not just the money or the ships or the people, it's just the English believing after this happens that uh, God sent the storms to destroy the Spanish Armada and that they are the chosen people and that Protestant religion is right and Catholic, the, the belief, Catholic beliefs are wrong. English Protestants are correct and God supports them. And the Spanish Catholics are wrong, and God is against them. And before that, I mean, Philip knew there was going to be issues trying to take over England, but he just said, God will support us, and we'll, we'll win because God believe, we believe in God, and God is on our side. And uh, after multiple defeats, that, that belief and the confidence and that uh, cultural superiority starts to uh, disintegrate. And uh, in England, it starts to strengthen. And that is the end of the story for today. Queen Elizabeth is going to die in 1604. Um, the worst part about her death, I would have to say, uh, is that she doesn't have um, a son or a daughter. She, she never gets married, and there's a good reason for that. It's one of the other peculiar things about her, but I think... Whatever you believe, whether she didn't want to, or she tried to, or she couldn't, I think the reality is that um, the, the right person was not there. And there was a very real possibility that if she married, that person would cause political problems for her and diminish her own control over the country and cause instability. So instead, she just what basically happened was she had some boyfriends. She had some guys that she was interested in. I think that's true. She did like them and she probably thought about marrying some of them, but they just didn't fit. There was no political, you know, personal, financial, and, and uh, religious, all, all these factors that she, she had to consider so many things about who she was going to marry. None of it fit well enough. There was nobody that was a good match. She was the most desirable woman in Europe for the first 20 years. When she was young, every, everybody who was a prince, uh, the son of an important person, uh, future king, every single one of them thought about marrying her. So she could have married anybody she wanted, but she didn't marry any of them. There's good reason for that. Again, I, I'm a really big fan of Queen Elizabeth and, um, She's a good writer. Um, she meets, she's, very, she's very indecisive is usually what people criticize her for. But, I mean, indecision was um, caution for her. Um, she, she was an expert at, at manipulating and understanding um, how decisions should be made. So I'm not in any position to judge her. So I'm going to say Queen Elizabeth the Great... That's where we're going to stop. 1604. We're going to go forward. We're going to go forward with, uh, you know, the colonization of America. Um, James, King of Scotland, King of England, James VI of Scotland, James I of, of England. Interesting guy. He's going to, he's the nephew of Queen Elizabeth. He's going to become the king. And we're going to talk about the Civil War and everything else next week as we move into the 17th century. And uh, that's the end of the lecture. I'm sure you're relieved, as I am, that this uh, lecture is over. Thank you for listening, and uh, talk to you again next week. Don't forget that you have an assignment about a turning point in British history uh, after 1066. It's due next Thursday, April 16th. Thank you for listening. Have a good night.